Thank you all so much for attending our Choose Love Spotlight webinar this evening featuring Caroline McGuire. This webinar, like our Choose Love programming, is offered without charge. We believe there should be no obstacles to choosing love as we work to create a safer, more peaceful, and loving world. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule tonight to join us for this exciting webinar. We're so grateful to have one of our amazing Choose Love partners, Caroline McGuire, here tonight to share her knowledge and experience with us all. Caroline McGuire holds a master's in education with a concentration in SEL training and is the author of Why Will No One Play With Me, the winner of three awards, including the Best Parenting and Family Book 2020 as awarded by American Book Fest, as an author, speaker, media contributor, and founder of a social emotional learning methodology, her primary focus is to help people of all ages make friends and thrive. You can visit her website at carolinemcguireauthor.com, follow her at, at author Caroline M, and download her free video, Good Winner, Good Loser. For scripts, tools, advice, and actionable exercises on developing social skills, check out Why Will No One Play With Me. And we will put some of these things in the chat for you that I just mentioned. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to toss the mic over to you. All right. Thank you so much. I love being part of Choose Love and actually getting to see all of you. It's always a good night when I get to be with everyone. Um, I am going to also mention um, a program that I did with Choose Love that's almost finished. Um, called How to Sell. So throughout tonight, I will share with you some videos that I made with real kids using the lessons from Why Will No One Play With Me. Um, it's a wonderful subscription program and everything goes to Choose Love. I, this is, doesn't benefit me at all, except that I got to work with so many wonderful children to make these videos. So I will be sharing those with you. And I'm gonna share my screen and get into this so that we can learn together. Um, and so I'll start by telling you that um, this is something that I'm super passionate about, which is helping educators to um, and parents to learn how to be more coach-like and to help kids into social-emotional learning. You know, social-emotional learning is something that Scarlett Lewis realized um, about and has, has formed this movement, but it's also become this incredible buzzword. And one of the things I've found over the past 16 years as I've been doing this is that the more we bring social emotional learning into our daily conversation, the more children absorb it. And it's lighter for educators, I think, and for parents. So I'll tell you just one thing about myself. So I um, was uh, working with kids 16 years ago. I had uh, a, a degree, a master's in education, and I was um, starting to do a lot with ADHD kids. That's my main population that I've been working with, although now I work with any kid. And what I found was that there was no guide for parents to give them um, a user-friendly um, information that they could how to understand how to develop kids' social skills. And I think as educators, many of you probably experience this as well. People write you four-page emails. Maybe it's not your forte or, or area of expertise, and um, you needed something user-friendly. And I have tons of materials on my website, which I'll share at the end, carolinemcguireauthor.com free for educators and parents um, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And how all this really came to fruition was I was talking to a little boy one day and I think we were talking about reading laws. So if you know anything about us ADHD kids, we will read your book, but we will never write it down in a log. And um, I asked this little boy kind of an adult question. I asked him, you know, what would you change if you could change anything or something? And he said, you know what I want to know, Caroline? I want to know why will no one play with me? And I had seen a lot of social challenges, and I had seen that there's this gulf where kids who have a diagnosis receive services for social skills. Probably not enough parents still need information, but there's also a, a huge population, millions of children who don't come to understand social skills 
just by watching people. They need direct instruction. And so all this work came to be because of this one little boy, wonderful little boy who is now a grown up. And it's all because he asked me that really poignant question of why will no one play with me. And so my goal for tonight and my goal always is to provide educators and parents with very tangible ways that you can bring social emotional learning into daily life and to break everything down into very user friendly steps. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit throughout the night about the How to Sell program and just share with you some video clips so you can see real kids doing these exercises. And they're of all ages from all over the world. And then I'm also going to mention a couple of concepts, one of which is in a TED Talk that I did that came out Friday. So um, Janie will share that TED link in the chat. And I will ask you humbly if you can comment and share on YouTube. It would mean a lot. And I think you'll find it very, very fascinating and good for all your students. So I, one of the things I think we need to do to bring all of the cell forward is to strengthen the parent-home connection. And I have a lot of packets and handouts on my website for this. But the one way we can do it is to give parents how do they do um, and how do they reinforce what we're doing in the classroom to give them language and for parents and educators to understand how we coach kids. How do we help them witness and look at what they're doing so that they can understand? Many, many kids that many of us know may alienate people or may not be able to have the best social emotional State, but they don't necessarily have the self-awareness to understand what they're doing. And so the more we strengthen that parent education and the more we make that connection, the easier the burden becomes on the school and the more parents can reinforce, right? So if you're saying in your classroom, boss your body, if parents have that language, then I can use it with my kids at home. That's a little kid term, but for teenagers, same thing. What are we doing? What are we educating about? So as adults, I'm sorry, it always comes down to us. We have to start with a reset and we have to sort of learn to put the oxygen mask on first. I think we've all been through a lot with the pandemic. And so many of us have had a hard time social emotionally, and we have to learn to give ourselves um, that reset and those calming strategies. And I can't speak enough. I know Scarlett is bringing this to schools. There's a technique called havening. If you haven't done it, it's phenomenal. It's free and easy. And I'm happy to follow up with an email about that. I use it with many kids all the time. So one of the things about coaching is that we're trying to help kids witness their behavior, but I'm not telling them. So as a parent and as a, as a person, many of us, we fall into the trap where I tell you things. Rather, we are going to use open questions and reflective listening. And I'll touch base on for autistic kids, how we handle this differently um, in a couple slides. But the idea here is that rather than telling a kid something, we're going to be active in the coaching process throughout our day. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute and throughout our role as a parent. And we're going to ask them questions rather than tell them. And this all comes from being really curious. So if we have the mindset of curiosity, then we can ask them, what do they mean by that? How come? Simple questions that allow them to think and reflect. So instead of as a parent saying to them, you know, everybody else does this, to ask them, what do you think other people do? What do you think they join? What does it mean to mix in? You know, who are you playing with these days? so that we allow kids to hear themselves and understand what they're thinking and go through that process. Because part of self-awareness is built when we actually hear ourselves talk and we witness and hold up a mirror 
to the social world. So to me, one of the big gaps in cell, and yep, I am calling them out for this, is that cell talks to kids rather than asks them to deeply experience it. So, you know, think about the Socratic method and other things we do in education where we ask kids to think about larger themes. I think one of the pieces is that in order to fit in and be social, you have to witness the social world. There are certain norms, there are certain things going on. And so this method of reflective listening and open questions is meant to do that. So the reflective listening is the easiest technique. And I always joke that it works for mother-in-laws. So many of us have holidays coming up. If you have difficult people in your life, I can't tell you enough that reflective listening is something that you can use. They actually use this me method in some prisons because what it does is you recap the person's words exactly or the gist of what they say. And by doing that, they feel super validated. Think about any time anybody repeats back something you say, you feel very heard. This is especially powerful for teenagers because teenagers do experience a lot of prejudice, a lot of people not listening to them. So what happens here is that I'm gonna repeat back what they say, either the gist or the exact words, and then the kid can confirm no, that's not what I meant at all. Or they can clarify. They can feel validated and they can express something like, oh, no, you, you're not getting it. It's this instead. When you do this, something magical happens where it's almost like they float above their body and they hear what they're saying, what you're saying, and they witness it. So I'm going to give an example. Many, many of the kids that I work with have behaviors they do that alienate other kids, but they often tell me that it doesn't, or it doesn't matter, or it's only in this one discrete situation. And this is because of low self-awareness and also them not witnessing the social world. So I had a boy I used to work with, and he would do like this. He would tell people to speed up their conversation. He would make little hand motions, and he would do different things, and it really alienated people. And he was in middle school, and his parents were rightly worried that if he went to a new school where people didn't know him for high school, that people would not like this. And so what I, all I did was to reflect back to him what he said. He said that he thought people needed to speed things up. They needed to use economy of words. They needed to get to the point. And I just repeated it back. And he said, Caroline, that sounds awful. And I said, what? I'm just repeating what you said, right? So I play a little dumb. And what happened was he heard what he had been saying. Now, had his mother said a thousand and one times, you can't say things like that. You're alienating people. Absolutely. But what happened was hearing his own words started the wheels turning. So this method also doesn't work overnight. What we're trying to do is help kids witness and it starts the wheels turning. And this can work with anything from academics to social and to deepen their understanding. So I can't stress enough how much it works. And by the way, if your mother-in-law is annoying you at a holiday, reflect to them. And you might get a little bit of progress. So the other thing that happens when you use these open questions and reflective listening is you get a lot of truthful information. I'm going to tell you that as adults, everybody always tells me they know exactly what's going on with their child. And when I sit down with the child and ask them of any age, they could be 30, they could be five, usually the parents are not right. <laughs> and so when we use this method, we get a lot of information. They also do a lot of perspective taking, right, which is something we're going to talk about tonight. And they learn about the social world. Now, if a kid has more limited language, we can still ask them questions. We're just going to use visual underpinnings 
And we're, we're showing them the social world, right? So rather than telling them this is not something you can do or delivering a lesson, and I know Choose Love would never do this, but in many cell programs, they just sort of deliver the lesson at the kids. We're allowing them to participate and think about things. So I have a little video I want to play of me coaching a real kid. And the reason I want to share this with you is that I think it's really important for you to hear how imperfect I am in this um, and what information you get that you didn't have before. So we're going to try this and hope technology goes our way. So you told me that sometimes people make friendly gestures toward you and that you don't always respond. No, my anxiety gets the best of me. What does that feel like? Like everything just, I start getting down on myself and I just feel like, oh, I'm, I'm awkward, I sca I'm scared. It, nothing, I'm not doing anything right. So it's the fact that you're worried that you might look scared and awkward that's an issue? Yeah. Okay. What makes you worry that you might look scared and awkward? I don't smile. Okay. I don't look happy. Okay. What's the fear about looking scared and awkward? Like what? Because if I look scared and awkward, no one will want to talk to me. Oh. What makes you say that? Because people who are scared and awkward, I mean, they're not fun and exciting, so people don't usually want to talk to them or play with them. I feel like I'm boring. Like people in my grade, they're just... Like some people will just crowd around them and they're just so fun and they tell these great stories that make everyone laugh. And I don't have stories like that. I don't say things like that. So what I hear you saying is that you think being outgoing and being a good storyteller is what makes you a good friend? I mean, no, but sort of. So you told me so I wanted to, to just move on, but you hear a lot of information that that girl is giving that you might not have known before. And this can also be something that we do in daily life in the classroom. So I have here the different steps of learning a new behavior. And this is all straight from social emotional learning 101, Albert Bandura, uh, monkey see, monkey do experiments that still hold up. and we know that we need live modeling. We know we need to experience the behavior. We know we need to rehearse and reenact, to self-correct and to practice. And part of that is instead of telling the kids, be cooperative, right? We want them to experience it, right? So part of being brave, our brave pose, is experiencing being brave and then knowing what it feels like. It's experiencing making chit chat and then knowing what it feels like and being able to self-correct. If we don't believe because of low self-awareness that we need any of these skills, then they're less likely to embrace and take them on. So kids tell me all kinds of things and, and parents write me from all over the world and they tell me things kids say. And so we're trying to keep, teach kids these social emotional skills so that they have better control of their emotions. But here's one for you. What if I don't think I need control of my emotions? I think everybody else should just adjust. And if I'm in a bad mood, everybody should just adapt around me, right? So part of the open questions and reflective listening is to add another layer to this social emotional learning, which is to help kids take perspective, understand other people, and understand the social world. Understand that people aren't all going to adapt and tiptoe around you. And I have to tell you on social media, one of the number one things people write me is, what if I do if my kid doesn't think they need this? So part of what we can also do is we can reinforce and be play coaches, social coaches in daily life in the classroom, in stations, in table time, in reading time, in snack, so that instead of it being a social lesson that's pulled out, 
which I know takes so much out of us and is so much, we're trying to have this social perspective, this social emotional perspective in what we do. And we can just ask kids. And one of the best questions ever to me is how come? Because it can be quick and you don't have to think of some big thing, right? Just how come? What are you thinking? And we can at reading, at stations, at snack, have these conversations and ask kids to think about and witness what's going on and to deepen whatever lesson you're teaching. So coaching on the spot to me is asking, you know, well, what is, what is your friend? What does Lorea think about this? Or, oh, how would anybody else feel if X happened? It's pulling in, we're going to talk about characters and literature. It's allowing them to embed this social learning in every facet of their learning so that it's not just a pullout lesson, it's a mindset. So taking learning emotion, emotions, expressions, emotional vocabulary, right? Um, if a child is fighting with a sibling, we can bring this in and ask them, how does your sibling feel right now? What emotion are they showing on their face? So we can do scavenger hunts where kids are, and I'm going to teach you about social spy, the t subject of my TED talk in a minute, where kids are spying and watching other kids and looking at facial expressions and learning to read them. And then we can bring it into daily life. What does it feel like right now? We can take field trips throughout the school where we are watching different emotions and collecting how do different people look when they're frustrated, sad, angry, all these different things. And this way we're pulling this into daily life. It, it, as an educator, to not be afraid to say, read my face right now. What are you reading? Because then we're not just having a lesson, we're pulling this into our daily existence. And as a parent too, we can do this. Um, you know, if your kid walks in and you're in the middle of a mess and there's stuff all over the floor and you're cleaning it up and they say something insensitive like, I'd like my dinner now, we can turn and say, what are you reading right now? What's happening? So all this is predicated on a concept that I love, 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 and a lot of schools are doing now, and I'm happy to provide anything that you all need to do this in schools, which is called Social Spy. And this is the TED Talk that Janie's going to share in the chat um, that goes into how to be a social spy. And it's a really simple concept, sort of a one-stop shopping concept, which is that um, it helps you with this observation process. So some kids learn through direct instruction. Some other kids need to be taught these things, and they need to be shown how different social behaviors look and you know a lot of times kids come to me and they they are not sure what people talk about they're not sure how to move their body into a group they're not sure about different things and so the concept of social spy is that we watch people without directly watching them we're not creepy and we observe them and i teach kids how to watch indirectly and observe specific behaviors so that we learn from our environment and from live models. So anything you want a kid to learn, we can spy on. How do people study? How do people forgive? How, how are people compassionate, right? Um, and we're allowing them to notice the people in their environment and spy to understand. And I, I have a great story that just came up. Um, a girl was experiencing, unfortunately, some mean girls, and she was being told by some of them that she was going to be excluded and that certain people were friends with so-and-so and were going to exclude her. So she spied and she watched and she observed and she said, you know, those people they claim they're friends with don't acknowledge them or speak to them. I don't know that they're going to be a factor. And by spying, she observed what was really going on and realized she was going to be okay. 
I have this happen all the time with kids who tell me that they're not going to join anything, but yet they're going to be able to meet people and make friends. So instead of telling them that's not the way it works, how are you going to meet people, all the things we as parents normally do where we tell, 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 I have them be a social spy, which I'm going to go into in a second how to do it, and I have them observe what do people do at school? What do people join? What do people with similar interests to you join? And what ends up happening is, again, they witness instead of me telling them, which is really wonderful. So SPY can help you obtain information about social interactions with other kids, have a visual model to navigate toward, like, I'm going to see how people do, you know, move themselves into a group. It allows them to compare their behavior to other people. And it also can reduce conflict as a parent, because instead of telling them something, you're asking them to observe. And as an educator, it can be something really powerful in terms of bringing some of these social emotional lessons alive and allowing them to witness caring, to witness perspective taking, to witness courage. And, oops, sorry. And it allows them to also sharpen their understanding of the unspoken rules of different environments. So one of my favorite spy lessons that's in Why Will No One Play With Me is when kids go around a school and observe what are the unspoken rules of the different classrooms and the different spaces. So, you know, in elementary school, a lot of things are written down, but not everything is written down. And whenever I get the syllabus for middle school and high school, I always sit down with kids and we go over how to read their teacher and how to read between the lines because the kids I work with don't really read between the lines. And I, I got to tell you, in society, a lot of people don't read between the lines. So one of the things we can do is we can have them be a social spy and spy on the uh, unspoken rules in different environments, the things that are not written down. It also can be something that really helps them observe and what I call zoom in and zoom out. So one of the things that research has found and I've found is that sometimes when people have tr struggles reading social cues, um, which is a huge percentage of the population, by the way, they actually have trouble sort of focusing in on someone's face and then zooming back out into the larger scene. And part of how you read social cues, if you think about it and you reverse engineer it, is really that you kind of zoom in and you zoom out kind of constantly. So one of the things I do with Social Spy is I have kids spy on different emotional states, different spatial expressions, different um, different scenes, and it really helps them with that zooming in, zooming out concept, and with being able to actually cope with distraction, cope with stimuli in their environment, and learn to kind of pause and observe those social cues. And it's just a piece of the puzzle, but I want to mention it because it's, it's really powerful. Um, so you can rehearse with the child ahead. Now I've worked with probably thousands of kids at this point, and I've never had anyone be caught spying if they don't want to spy, if they want to be subtle. Um, however, Everyone is always afraid. So I'm going to show you a video in a minute of rehearsal. But this is my college bookstore. And I took a picture because I thought it was great. And this is my son in the bookstore. And what you can do is you can go to a Barnes and Noble. You can go to the library at school. You can take a child that you're working with or that you're parenting and you can have them rehearse. Sit at Starbucks with a paper or a phone or a book or sit chatting with them and have them practice spying. Um, you can take them, if, if, you know, if nobody's around, take them to the hallway of the school and have them pretend to be in their locker, observing what's around and listening while they pretend to do things in their locker. And that's the video I'm gonna show you in a minute. I used to have in my office a giant um, 
box <laughs> that is about the size of a locker. And I would have kids just right here in the office pretend to observe and practice and rehearse this idea of spying. And that way they got better at it. If a child is on the spectrum, I have just, and they are struggling a little bit, or if they're struggling for any reason, I just add more practice time. We just practice spying more before I send them into the wild to spy. And part of this is a rehearsal process where they get more comfortable and we kind of talk through the things that they're worried about. Now, the How to Sell program, we have videos of me um, with this spy process, showing this spy process. And I'm going to show you a video in a minute of me debriefing with a kid. And it is hysterical, the information you get. Be wary. They're going to tell everything. <laughs> Um, the other thing we do is we give them a mission. So they're not spying on behavior in general because that's too much. They're spying on a specific behavior. And when they have completed that lesson or completed that thought, then we can go to another behavior. The kids I work with spy constantly and every week pretty much. And so, for instance, how do you join a group, right? Right. So they would be, from this point of view, looking at these girls and spying to see how does someone navigate into this group. Um, you can spy on pretty much anything. And what I tend to do is when kids don't have an answer or they're unsure of something or, or they're challenging me on something that I know is true, right, like people aren't going to all adapt to your mood, you have to adapt too. I tend to use spy because if they see with their own eyes, it reduces conflict. So now instead of them saying to me, you know, I don't think you're right, whatever, they've observed. Now, do they instantly tell me that I'm right? No. <laughs> but it's a process and it also gives them a tool for life. So a lot of adults that I work with will come to me and say, I don't know how to navigate this or that. If they know how to spy, then they know how to go into a situation, scan, observe, and figure out what's going on in that situation. So it's really like a life hack. So I'm going to show you this rehearsal. This is in my dining room. It's not beautiful, but I want to show you that rehearsing can be really simple and can allow kids to figure out how they're going to spy and observe without being noticed. Okay, so if you were at your locker and you were pretending to spy, can you show me what you would do? I can't open it. I need help. <laughs> okay. So how would you be at your locker, but spying on other kids? Awesome. So it's a simple process where I'm allowing them to observe. And again, kids always bring up a couple things. Will I get caught? Will anyone notice? Will anyone think I'm creepy and weird? And what I do is I have them, if they're teenagers especially, um, they'll spy and then they'll report back to me. And that's what you're about to watch here is where kids are reporting back to me. And what I do is I have them come up with a code system if they need to remember something and, and re report to me. So whether they write it in their planner or they write it in their phone or some of them text me live. It's like live tweeting while they're doing it. And I'm always like, you shouldn't have your phone out at school. But what happens is they, they need just a little code system so that if somebody saw, they wouldn't really know what it was about because they're always afraid someone's going to catch them spying. Part of what I also really love about having this TED Talk out is that I did a bunch of research about how much we as a species and a society spy and observe other people. And there's a website uh, an Instagram, sorry, in New York called Overheard New York that has 1.6 million followers and people actually report in things they hear in public 
and things they're basically observing and spying about. And so I've been using that too with kids to kind of assuage them and say people, people watch and they spy every day. It's just not something we all talk about as much. So you're not you know, going to get caught necessarily. But what I really love about this technique is that it allows kids to find out tons of information that they don't necessarily have. And my sales pitch from the sell perspective is that if I want to really take on these social emotional skills, I also have to be observant in order to embed them in my daily life. And one of the things I've noticed about kids who struggle socially is they tend not to be observant. So this isn't an indictment of them, but if you think about the people you know who don't necessarily read the room, often they're not observant people and they're not watching all the social cues. And so Spy allows them, the reason I started it 16 years ago was because I wanted something that would allow people to really get to be better noticers and observers so that they would get in the habit of knowing that when I enter a situation, when I'm in a situation, I need to notice and observe. So we're going to talk in a little bit about scavenger hunts and different things you can do, but I think the more we allow kids to sort of practice that noticing and observing muscle, the more it can also help them academically because if they're not observing social cues, they may not also be observing other nuances in academe, which we notice. So I'm gonna just play this for you. This is from the How to Sell program and this is me debriefing with a kid. It's just a minute to show you kind of what information you get, which is a ton. Do you ever have a time when you are like watching other girls and you're trying to kind of assess them and figure things out? Uh, yeah, so um, usually at recess, most of the girls would be playing soccer and I don't really play soccer very much, but sometimes I would join in and uh, not usually, but when I did join in, it'd be fun. And when I didn't, I would usually watch them and see how they interacted with each other. And like the smiles when they got a goal, the frowns when the other team scored a goal. And it was interesting. So do you ever what, I, have what I would say to you is when I'm working with a kid or when you as a parent or an educator are working with someone, um, if everybody plays soccer, then one of the ways that you fit in and join in is to play soccer, right? So right there, you have that observation. Spy, what do people do at recess? Comes back, well, they play soccer. And then they say to me, I'm not going to play soccer, Caroline. Okay, right? Spy again, what else could you do, right? So we're building the missions. It's not just one mission. Um, and by the way, if you could do this with all of your relatives this holiday season, we'd probably have less strife, but like you're building the mission. So oftentimes you get them coming back and they, and they say something to you, but then they're like, oh, but I'm not going to change. Or you're building the perspective taking. So it's a great tool. We're going to put some things in the chat for you at the end, but um, I, I can't stress enough what a game changer it is. Bridging into some other things, um, I have a lesson called Sticky Brain. So I thought of this as something fun for educators because um, I, a lot of kids who have big emotions, they get stuck in our brain and they're very big ruminators. And so what I do is I have this foam head <laughs> and I got it off Amazon super cheap. And I put Velcro on the foam head and then thought bubbles, which I'm going to show you. And you can use the visual that's up here from Why Will No Play With Me, but I love the foam head. And I have kids stick their thoughts, the thoughts that get stuck in their head on the foam head. I do this with little people. I do this with people who are 30. And what ends up happening is it becomes a shortcut language for them of things that get stuck. And 
what I find is that people who are ruminators have all these things that are churning inside them. It could be a really great classroom lesson, like everybody, you know, make a sticky brain and talk about all the things that get stuck in your head. And I have these little, um, you know, little thought bubbles and I just stick Velcro on the back and make them. There's, of course, the visual in the book and a visual I'm happy to share in these slides that's, um, that's paper, but I love the sticky brain and kids tend to love it too. Not just little kids, older kids. And when I work with teenagers, this is one of my number one exercises because teenagers have so much that they're carrying and this allows even the most recalcitrant, I don't like being here, Caroline person to kind of unlock themselves and talk about what's getting stuck in your brain. So it's a great way to get people talking. Um, and I usually have pre-printed sort of, you know, things that get stuck in your brain and that's in the book. But I also would say to you, I leave some blank. And what I do is I laminate them and then I use a, a whiteboard marker. And that way they can write down things that um, get stuck in their brain. And it really, really unlocks them. Something about it allows them to talk about it. And then it becomes a short shortcut. You know, I'll say, well, how was your day? Well, I had sticky brain today. Um, and, and it really, it really helps them. The other thing I love to do is learning to walk in someone else's shoes. So this is a fun way to do perspective taking. Um, this is a mat that I have in my office. Um, but I used to do this just with craft paper where I would draw a giant circle and have different shoes around it. And when I'm talking about something, I ask kids to step on the mat and step into different people's shoes. Um, and it's been very popular over the years. People are always asking me to sell and produce the mats on my website, and I just have never found it sort of cheap enough to, to do it in mass production. But um, <laughs> one, of my, um, one of my favorite uh, folks I trained just literally did this with giant pieces of paper in her classroom. So it's definitely doable. But the idea about the mat is that I give them scenarios or whenever we're discussing things, we step into people's shoes. And then again, it becomes a shorthand. It's fun. It's interactive. Again, I'm very into, I do this stuff with teenagers too. I don't care that you're older. It's a way for them to think about and experience being in someone else's shoes. So I do it for everything from, you know, when you canceled on Mrs. So-and-so three times, how do you think she felt? And then she didn't make another appointment with you. Do you think it's possible, right, that there's some connection? Um, to also even like, let's step into the shoes of siblings. Let's step into the shoes of mom and dad. Let's step into the shoes of that friend. They're being snippy to you, but what's going on in their life? Um, since I started working with Choose Love a couple of years ago, I've been doing this presentation. And one of the things that's happened is that teachers are now doing this activity to deepen cell understanding and to allow um, students to step into the shoes of their peers. Um, and this I'm also doing with Chicago Public Schools and a bunch of other places. And what happens is we're giving them this experiential um, intervention so that they can think more about the perspective taking that we want them to do as, as a foundation of, of cell. All right, hot and cold bear hunt. So I told you I was gonna talk about facial expressions and scavenger hunts and stuff. So part of becoming a better noticer is that we all give off signals in our body, right? We tell you things with our body and our voice. And one of the things that um, people have told me over the years is that often when people don't read social cues, the other person in a conversation or the other person in life is trying to give them signals because no one really wants to say, can you stop talking now? Or I'm not interested in this topic. We all kind of want to be kind, right? But when you think about the people in your life who don't really read social cues, 
they don't tune into body language and they don't realize that we're all sending messages. One of the things I've always been intent on doing and inventing in my, in my massive invention of different lessons is to help kids understand that all around them, everywhere in the world, people are sending them social, social messages with their body and voice and face and not necessarily with words, right? And so I, the hot and cold bear hunt is the gateway to this. You're going to see in this video that kids play a game where there's somebody leading. You can be leading as the teacher or the parent. And you're going to have a facial expression for hot and a facial expression for cold. You're going to hide a bear somewhere in your classroom or in your house you're not going to speak. They have to watch your face for those different facial expressions to know whether they're hot on the trail of the bear or cold for the bear. What happens is it's a game. It's fun. I want to find the bear. So they start watching the leader's face. What happens is they start to realize to get a message and understand what's going on, I must watch people's face. And it's like a switch goes inside them where they start to realize that face is telling you things. Now, I'm not saying that they then read social cues easily. I'm not saying there's not wor more work to be done. There is. But part of what we struggle with with kids who don't read social cues is for them to understand that those messages are coming at them. So the mindset is incredibly important. And any of you who are doing this or any of you who are parenting these kids know you're really out there all the time trying to get them to understand this. And instead of doing it in a way that we often do where we tell kids, which can hurt their feelings, this is a way to do it where they experience it and it's kind of magical. So I'm gonna show you just this little quick video of the kids doing hot and cold bear hunt. Watch how over the course, they start noticing that they have to pay attention to the person doing the things. Cause I think, it's, I think that's the best part of this video. We're gonna play a game. Okay, the goal of the game is to find the bear that I've hidden. When I go like this, it means you're getting close. When I go like this, it means you're getting farther. Okay, ready? Go! <laughs> this is a lesson you can do easily at home or with kids. I actually did this to film the how to sell. This wonderful family did this for me and filmed it during COVID. But I will tell you that I've done this with many families virtually where I just coach them through it and many schools. And it's an easy activity. And it allows kids to really start understanding. My other favorite thing that isn't featured here, but I have to mention, is to have scavenger hunts where they search for people's facial expressions and search for what do people look like when they're grumpy, when they're frustrated, and go throughout a school or throughout your home, throughout your neighborhood, looking and spying for those different facial expressions, body language, and sort of coming to understand. Um, it's fun, and again, it starts to really get them understanding to read that body language, because that's like three-fourths of the battle, is for them to understand that they need to. 
Um, so as a person with ADHD, I will tell you that a lot of the social emotional lessons out there for emotions and how big they are kind of bug me because they're about this idea of how big it should be, not necessarily how big it is. And so working with the population that I worked with originally before I kind of was into every kid, um, I really found that the intensity of our emotions is what it is. So when we think about it should be this way or that, it doesn't matter. It's really how intense does it feel to you? And maybe you're a person with great emotional control and you haven't ever experienced that, but I'll just share with you as a person who has experienced that, this is just a different shift. And so when I work with kids, one of the things I'm always doing is looking at and helping them recognize how intense do things feel for me? Because it doesn't really matter how intense it should be. If you're working with kids and you're trying to help them learn better social emotional coping mechanisms, if it feels super intense to them, then they have to kind of start from there. So I have a couple things that I do around intensity meters and them kind of coming to understand. Now, part of this is them understanding that maybe this is super intense and other people don't feel as intensely, but I think it really starts to with how big does this feel? And so I have this exercise for littler people, and I'm going to tell you how to bridge it up for teenagers. So I ask them, how does the worry feel? And I use trucks and cars and Mack trucks, and you can use anything to represent that feeling. So is it as small as a bicycle or is it as big as a Mack truck? What does it take to carry that worry, right? And you can also, for teenagers, I'll use different balls. And I have like a giant yoga ball and I have a ball that's the Death Star from Star Wars that's like really big. And I'll show them those balls and be like, how big does it feel? So part of what happens with this social emotional stuff is that you as a parent say something simple and you get this like huge reaction from them or you as an educator are trying to help someone and you're thinking that their emotion is, you know, small as a bicycle and you're getting this flood of emotion back. The more they can come to understand that there's different levels of intensity that they're experiencing, the more they can go into a place where they modulate things. But they can't really name it to team it. They can't really necessarily identify the emotion until they understand this concept of intensity. And part of this, I think what I've seen over the years is they do start to understand like how big my emotions are versus maybe yours. So the, the stuff that's out there that's great, um, you can use next, right? You can use different lessons from why will know and play with me to help them learn to name it and tame it and to process those emotions. But the idea here is they learn about the intensity and they learn how much do I need to carry it? The other thing I recommend parents can do, and you could do this in the classroom, is to print this out and have it in your car or just have a quick code word between you and the child where you can ask them, what does it take to carry this worry, right? When they get in the minivan and they can say to you, like, this is a Mack truck. And then I would encourage parents, it doesn't matter that this is a minor thing, right? To them, it feels like a Mack truck. Because of that intensity, they're going to need more powerful things to process that emotion than they would if it wasn't as big as a Mack truck. And so I think that the missing piece in the emotional lessons that we have out there is this intensity. And it, it really is profound for some of us. So I would tell you this lesson works like gangbusters. I use it with the balls for the older kids. 
I vary the toys depending on what toys they're into. If they um, have a special interest, then you can use dinosaurs. If they have an interest in, you know, certain Hello Kitties, you can use Hello Kitties. It doesn't matter. It's this idea of scale and intensity that I find really helps, especially with kids who are struggling to manage and process their emotions. Rather than going right to name it to team it, we're going to start at the intensity of the emotions and how big it feels inside you. So it's just, it's a great exercise. I can't say enough about it. Okay, so during the pandemic, I was annoyed, as I'm sure many of you were, and things were really tough, and I wanted kids to be able to continue to grow and learn, um, and I'm kind of one of those people I don't really accept limitations, um, which is why Scarlett Lewis and I are friends, because I just don't accept limitations, and I wanted to help children continue to develop theory of mind or this understanding of perspective taking and other people's inner emotional life. But in many cases, I was limited because I couldn't go to their house um, and they weren't even going to school. So I developed an exercise and this isn't in why will no one play with me, but I share it with you because it's so successful and it's so easy to do. And I am going to develop it and put it on my website. But I wanted kids to understand what is hard for some kids, especially kids on the spectrum, but all kids, is that not everybody has the same interest as you, and people have different perspectives, and people have different thoughts, right? And so what I do is I have everybody in a family or in a class make popsicle sticks of their interests. And so you just have them cut out pictures, print out pictures, and put them on a popsicle stick. Then I have everybody stand up holding their popsicle sticks. Now, sounds so simple. But what happens for certain kids is when they see that not everybody has the same popsicle sticks, there's some wheels that start turning, right? I have dinosaur popsicle sticks, but you don't. We don't all like the same thing. And then I go through and I have kids make conversation and chit chat and ask kids what they'd like to talk about or to talk about the topics on those popsicle sticks, which they don't always like, but it's super good for them. And it allows them to really witness a couple things. Not everybody has the same perspective as me which is incredibly important. We know from self-awareness research that one of our handicaps in life is that one way that we read other people and take their perspective and step into their shoes is that we actually reflect and project our own experience and a time when we felt similarly. What's the problem with that? Well, I haven't lived your life and you haven't lived your, my life and I have biases, right? And this is part of what happens with racial bias, prejudice, all these different things. There is a new groundbreaking study that validates my entire existence, so I'm pretty happy about it, that I've already shared with Scarlett, so it'll definitely get embedded, which shows that in order to take someone's perspective fully, you must understand their emotions. It makes total sense to me in every way, shape, or form. So I'm like so excited by it because I've always thought that, right? But now I have actual proof. So what happens is if I have a popsicle stick and I'm looking at your popsicle stick, we could also do emotional popsicle sticks, right? What's your emotion? What are your feelings about a topic? And we can really start to build this perspective taking so that kids start to understand the inner emotional life of other people. It's not the same as me. Their experience isn't the same as me. I'm feeling X, they're feeling Y. So we're talking and we're building those schools with skills with this activity and we're also building perspective taking. And what I find with kids who don't understand not everybody is the same as me, 
and they really have this aha moment when they see all these different people with these popsicle sticks. And so during the pandemic, when I wanted to teach this skill, I invented this so that families could facilitate that learning because one of my big shticks is that I like to educate parents so that they can do lessons at home and they can continue this social emotional learning and they can facilitate this growth. So I share this with you because it's cheap, easy, fun, and it works. This is another one. So business schools have started implementing ways for people to learn to play well with others. I'm sure that those of you who are educators are not shocked. I'm not really shocked either. Um, but when I was in graduate school, we actually did this activity where we had to learn to build something together and to to sort of facilitate together. And I have to tell you that even though I was in graduate school for social emotional education, not everybody played and not everybody was able to do it. And I'm sure you're not surprised. I'm sure if we did this with a group of teachers or something, they'd be the same. What I decided when I was when I was really building why will no one play with me was that this is an activity that families can do at home, teachers can do in the classroom, and there's really a lot of facets to it. And again, it's cheap and it's easy. So the idea behind building a tower, and this is a wonderful family that agreed, I'm not gonna show you the video, but they agreed to film um, for the how to sell videos them doing this activity in many different facets and they're just wonderful people to have done this for us but what we do is we have a, a tower that you build you can use legos tinker toys blocks and the idea is that we are building a tower together with either no rules so we're we're learning to be more flexible or there's timers, there's rules that switch. Maybe we aren't allowed to have certain pieces yet we build together. And all the rules of the building the tower are meant to have people have to work cooperatively together. Um, we also, uh, ha there's one of the activities in Why Will No Play With Me is that like halfway through building the tower, all the roles change. And so what it is, is it's a series of activities that build on each other. So I don't make everybody change roles in the first time they play. But the idea here is that we have to kind of learn to work cooperatively together. So if you are in a classroom where people are not working cooperatively together, not that that would ever, ever happen, right? And you have a group of kids that aren't gelling and aren't cohesive. This can be a beyond fabulous activity. And I have to credit business schools that I saw this and I was like, I literally wrote to the professor who invented it. And I said, I work with kids and I want to, you know, give you credit, but, but use this activity and sort of twist it and turn it and blow it up. Um, and the professor was like, good luck to you. Go ahead. But, you know, it, the idea here is that if, if you watch the how to sell videos, there's clearly some of the kids who do not like the rules that we have or the shifts that we do. And part of what I, I advise is having the conversations ahead where we give them coping strategies and then we facilitate, right? Last time this didn't work because of X. What skills do we need to build so that you can communicate more, whatever it is. So it's just a building activity, but there's many, many nuances to it, and it helps kids learn to build together. So I, I can't stress enough that it works. Okay, the little red hen. So in one of my first conversations with Scarlett Lewis, we discovered that we both love this book, The Little Red Hen. Um, and there's actually a book called The Little Red Elf that I found a couple years ago for her. Um, and it's just a fun little book if you're, if you're looking for a great little book. Um, when I use books and stories to help teach kids social emotional skills, I know that any of you in a classroom, you read books, you have kids read books. When I do this with older kids, we use older books. 
But what I love to do is I love to pick books with deep social emotional characters. And I think Little Red Hen rocks. I think she has such deep social emotional roots. Think about the story. You have this person who's trying to get everybody to cooperate. Not everybody does. She expresses her emotions. She expresses frustration with everybody. She um, tries and tries to get them to work together, and they express their disinterest. So what I do is we read the book, and then we look at and talk about the hen's feelings, her perspective, the other character's perspective, um, you know, what what does participation mean? What does it mean to join in? And we really try to look more deeply at the characters and their motivation, their energy, their perspective. Um, what are the signs and signals they have that they are not happy or happy? Or what is the, you know, the little red hen at one point like stomps and expresses herself. Um, and the little red elf is right up there, right up there too. So I try to use books so that kids can not just read them and hear a story, right, but can also step into the shoes of the characters and realize more deeply what's going on. And it's a way to get that social emotional learning in, um, but that's fun and that they enjoy and they don't feel preached at. So I can't stress enough the little red hen. I think she's She's great, and she tells us a lot. Um, reading the mood field trip. So with Social Spy, one of the things I love to do is to have kids go on a field trip. You can do this within your school. And I want them to spy on different emotional states. Mood and energy is a sort of nuanced thing that's very difficult for some kids to read and interpret. Um, and so the more we have them collecting information and spying and reading people's mood and reading, you know, how, how do they signify that mood with their body and voice, um, the more we can help them in life. Because part of what people sort of struggle with when they're reading the room is reading people's mood. So I have exercises in the book about spying and reading the mood, and I have kids write down their findings and report back. Um, and again, it's fun. You can do it in, in, you know, in your school. Go around your school and read people's moods um, since if you can't take them out somewhere. If you're a parent, um, box stores are just a palooza of social emotional ongoing stuff. So you could do a reading the mood field trip to a box store, um, food courts. Also, lots of things go on in a food court. And you could use that to have a reading the mood field trip. Um, I love to ask kids to pick five people, watch them, note their body language, and sort of report back. All those kind of activities really um, allow kids to figure things out. Um, this is a teacher had this was kind enough to send me all these drawings. So um, one of the activities that I think is really easy for a classroom is something called reading the Martian or drawing the Martian. Um, and this is also one will know play with me, but it's simple. Um, I have an exercise where I have the um, kids listen and they don't get to see anything. They just listen. And it's meant to build their listening skills. And I, I read a description, which you're seeing here, and then I ask them to draw a Martian. And almost no one gets it right. Every single picture is different. And so I had a teacher do this um, when we were making the how to sell video of this. And she gave me like a million different iterations of the Martian from her, her three or four different classes that she sees. Um, but what it does is it gets kids to sort of, in a very fun way, um, you know, listen and improve their listening skills. So it's easy and fun and you can do it in your classroom or you can do it at home. By the way, I've, I've never had anyone successfully draw the Martian per the instruction. Um, sticky brain is right there. Um, one of the last lessons I want to talk about is the impression you make on the world. So 
with the kids I work with, many of them don't really realize the impression they make in the world or how they, they present themselves. And I think this is kind of a universal problem. I mean, you know, it's something that we all see in the world, right? Um, and so what I wanted to do and what I came up with was to allow kids to see that we all leave an impression behind and that people have thoughts and feelings about those impressions. And you know, to think also about what kind of impression they want to make. So this can be a really great exercise for a class. It also can be an exercise you use with a child who is more complex and who doesn't necessarily realize their impression and how they are coming off to other people. Um, so I have this picture of the dino in the rock. I also sometimes use a picture of a, um, a seashell in the sand, or I'll use um, pictures of an angel, a uh, kid making a snow angel. And I just show them the picture and I say to them, we all leave an impression behind like this dino in the rock. And then I walk them through and ask them what impression they want to make. and what impressions they've noticed in other people and what makes an impression and what do people do with their body and voice to make an impression. It's a very simple exercise, but it's powerful. We talk about what makes a bad impression, what makes a good impression. What happens with some kids is it starts the wheels turning. They don't change that day but it allows them to start thinking about how they come off this idea that we make impressions. I use it with my most resistant kids. And I say resistant because I don't think they're really resistant. I think that they lack skills and they have unmet needs. Um, and if they could, they would do it. But I'll use the word resistant because I don't have a better word. The kids who want nothing to do with these social emotional lessons I tend to use this, these kinds of exercises because it allows them to start thinking and learning without sort of being too heavy handed. So it's a great exercise I wanted to share with you. You can do it for your whole class. It's very begin with the end in mind and um, it really starts their wheels turning. I can't stress that enough. I also love to have kids demonstrate being a good listener, having good listening looks, I call it, where you square your shoulders, you look at someone. I know for some kids making eye contact is very difficult and we're, we're having emerging realizations about asking children on the autism spectrum and stuff to make eye contact and that we are, that it is painful for them. But I think having kids Show that they're good listeners, watch a speaker, it's a life skill. And so you could have listening lessons in the classroom, demonstrate listening looks, and just then have this posted and then refer back to it. What does it look like to have a good listening look? And it's, again, a simple, easy exercise that they can do. Um, and you can refer to it. You know, what it, what is it like to have, be a good listener? What what can you do? Okay, my final exercise is my favorite. Tell a tight story. So you know how sometimes kids tell stories and they don't land and they kind of are meandering and they go everywhere and there's like no point and you're trying to figure out or even adults I notice who ask questions and I'm like, what is the point of your question? Where are we going with this? Um, what I call that instead of saying <laughs> that you monologue is telling a tight story. So I have kids tell a loose story, just a story about an event, but they did this weekend, anything. And then I ask them to think about who am I telling this story to? What is the point of the story? What do people need to know about this story? And why am I telling the story? And then I have them tell the story again, and I ask them to make it tight so that they rehearse sort of that self-editing process. 
you can have family dinners and ask people to tell stories and then to practice getting it tight. You can have your people in your classroom, especially if they're more verbose, try to ask questions in a tight manner. When I run social skills groups, I'm like, today we're going to be a tight story. So when you talk, I want you to, you know, who, what, where, when, let's keep it tight. Um, and I do this a lot with teaching people how to, to be tighter. When I teach kids to college interview, we work on telling a tight story because college interviewers don't have, you know, an hour and a half to listen to you meander. They want you to, to get to the point. So it's just a cute little thing that they can do in the classroom or at home to learn to sort of tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and not so many extraneous facts, which is also developmentally how kids are. All right. Well, I really want to leave time to take questions. Um, we're going to put um, the information about the TED Talk in the chat. I would be so grateful for any of you to comment, um, like, and share. Uh, the more comments you get in YouTube, the more it raises the, the TED in the algorithm and the more people it reaches, therefore. Um, I also have um, the How to Sell program I can't speak enough to. And um, there's the book, Why Will No One Play With Me? That's what I've been referring to. And I um, Choose Love will send you out the free gift, um, a video about helping kids learn to be good winners and good losers and to play games to build those social emotional skills, um, which is fun and again, free. Um, so Jeannie, should I unshare my screen and we can do some questions? That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. That was incredible. And so many really, really useful tools for parents and educators. Just amazing. So thank you so much, Caroline. No um, problem. Please feel free to put some questions in the chat and or just call out and ask your questions. And meanwhile, I will um, put some of the links in the chat that we spoke about. Thank you so much, Janie. My pleasure. Does anyone have any questions? I see some questions in the chat, which I wasn't able to observe while I was speaking, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions now. I teach social skills to elementary students. Is there progression to these lessons? Yes. So um, the way that Why Will No One Play With Me is set up is so that the lessons start easier and they matriculate toward harder. There, every executive function, executive function is the management system of the brain. Those skills are what drive all social skills. So every executive function um, has a section. So self-regulation, um, emotional regulation. And in each case, the lessons start easier and then they got harder and matriculate up. So in theory, the child learns, you know, and then as they're progressing, the lessons get, I wouldn't even say harder, they require more skill. You can start by doing the executive function questionnaire and seeing what the child needs to work on, or you can just pick lessons from the book at random or go through the entire, if you're a parent and you're like, I don't know what to do. Just go through the lesson track and follow it from beginning to end. If there's lessons that don't appeal to you, just skip them. Um, I put in about 150 lessons. And the reason I put in 150 lessons, even though it took years off my life, was that I wanted to make sure that there was enough content for kids to really practice this. And my, my real dream was that this would be a book that I was giving to families who can't necessarily afford professionals or whose kids don't necessarily qualify for services. And that the parent, yeah, obviously kids work easier with other people, but many parents are in a position where they have to help their child. There's no one else. 
So I wanted them to have enough content to really learn the skills. So that's why there's so many lessons. Um, I need this for one of the children who is the way to teach a child about emotional skills. Is this a program that I can do that I can purchase? Do you work with individuals via Zoom? So I um, don't see many clients myself anymore because I'm so busy with other stuff. But I have trained about 150 to 200 coaches in my methodology. Um, I own a co my other life is I own a coach training program that teaches people to be executive function ADHD social skills coaches, and it's the only accredited one in the world. So I train people, and they can definitely work one on one. And I'm happy to make referrals. I get nothing out of it. I just do it because I want people to be able to find resources for their kids. Um, and I always say that because I don't want people to think I'm getting money or something. Um, and um, we do work with individuals over Zoom. Um, and we did even before the pandemic because a lot of the kids I work with would rather die than go to a social skills group. And so this all started also because um, I needed to find ways to work one on one with kids. And so I went got a master's degree and did a ton of research. So you can use these lessons in a social skills group. And I have on my website, um, something I developed actually because Choose Love Ambassadors, Janie wanted it. They were like, I want a list of all the best lessons from Why Will No One Play With Me for a group. And I'm happy to send that if anybody needs to. I'll put my email in the chat. But you also can do this individually, one-on-one -on -one with kids um, or as a parent with kids. Awesome. Yeah, I um, I put those couple of things in the chat from you, Caroline. Thank you for sharing those resources. And also um, in the chat, I put a survey if you would be so kind as to give us some feedback on this wonderful workshop that Caroline presented tonight. And if you feel so moved, we would love for anyone to make a donation. There's a little donation link as well as we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of this tragedy. Um, we, we rely on donations and the, uh, the generosity of people like Caroline who come in and do these workshops for us at no cost. So thank you all so much. Do you, do you have any more questions or comments for Caroline? I just want to say one last thing. I'm happy to answer any questions if you email me. I'm a little crazed this week because of the TED link dropping, but um, I am I always re respond to every question. Um, I have Instagram videos now where if you if you follow me, I um, I make little lessons, little Instagrams. I actually spend a lot of time on them. Um, but I also want to say that this is very doable. Um, took me 15 years to write this book, which my next one won't take 15 years, I don't think. And the reason is that all the language is very user friendly, because so many um, social emotional programs are built for acad academe, and they're very um, dense. Um, and so I wanted this to be very user friendly for parents. So if parents write you four page emails, and you as a teacher do not have time to respond to them, but you know their child is suffering, um, give them this book, like give them the name of the book, give them some of my free sheets, share this with them because it will allow them to know answers. Um, and that's the reason I did all this. So um, uh, definitely, you know, let me know any questions you have. I'm more than happy to answer. Choose Love is my favorite part of any any day, anything. I do hundreds of trainings, and this was like a night I was excited to come do because um, it's such a wonderful organization and group, and anything they ask me to do or anything we can partner on, I'm like up for it, which I wouldn't say about everybody. Um, and something, a form for the free gift doesn't submit. Is the free yeah, gift not working? I just saw that. Um, let I'm me not... go. Let me grab the slide and just. Um, 
I'll recopy the link. Thank you, Caroline. I appreciate that. And if anything doesn't work, we can always have, you we'll can always write me or I can send it tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. We have a list of everybody's emails who attended tonight. And um, so we can follow up with that if you're still having difficulty with it. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. This was just amazing. I mean, the number of really simple yet powerful strategies that you shared tonight. I think anyone who's a parent or a teacher um, is very lucky to have attended tonight. And so we thank you very much for your time, for all that you do for Choose Love. And we wish you a really happy holiday season. You too. Thank you, everyone. And please watch the TED and tell me what you think and what you need. And I would love to watch your comments on YouTube. I was on YouTube all day responding to people's comments and it was really fun. So thank you so much. Excellent. Well, best of luck, Caroline. Not that you need it, but we're sending it your way. <laughs> no, thank you. I need luck. Everybody does. <laughs> All right, well, thank you all again for taking time out of your Tuesday evening to join us at Choose Love. And you can always visit our website. Um, there are a lot of free resources available from Choose Love. Our entire curriculum is actually free. You can sign up on our website and download that as well. So thank you for coming and we will be having more free webinars. So keep your eyes open for information from us. Have a happy, happy holiday season. Thanks for choosing love. Thank Bye. you, everybody.